Hello, everyone. I'm meteorologist Sean Sublett, and welcome to Across the Sky, our national Lee Enterprises weather podcast. Lee Enterprises has print and digital news operations in 77 locations across the country, including at my home base in Richmond, Virginia. I'm here with my meteorology co-host from across the sky, Joe Martucci in Atlantic City and Matt Hollander in Chicago. Kirsten Lang cannot join us today from Tulsa. She's feeling a little bit under the weather, uh, as it were. So Matt and Joe, uh, let's start with you, Matt, in Chicago. How are things holding up there? Pretty good. We're uh, very much in winter season now. We've got freezing rain in the Midwest. We've got snow in the Midwest. We've got cold in the Midwest. But you know what? A uh, cool thing happened uh, this week. Uh, a sign the Across the Sky podcast is growing because other podcasts are noticing us. So I was invited on the Fine Dining podcast, and they brought me on as a meteorologist because they uh, they actually review restaurants for this podcast. And so they wanted my take on Rainforest Cafe and the thunderstorms in Rainforest Cafe. So that was a lot of fun going on there. So if you want to check out the Fine Dining Podcast, their Rainforest Cafe episode, I make an appearance and I get a shout out of the Across the Sky podcast on there. It was a lot of fun. That sounds really, really cool. Joey, had anything exciting like that yet? Uh, Well, I went to Florida. Is that exciting? That Going to Florida is always exciting. So you had a wedding, right? Yeah, we had had a wedding in Jacksonville. My first time there. Uh, Congratulations to uh albert and caroline and we actually went to disney world my first time in disney world since 2005 so we did magic kingdom epcot hollywood studios and i remember it i mean it 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 was just like i remembered but like even better it is it's just so well done like everything is just so well done we were at the star wars place it, you know, in uh, uh, Hollywood Studios, you walk around, it felt like you were in Star Wars. You even went to the bathroom and it felt like you were in Star Wars there. They did not skimp out at any details. Um, so, yeah, I was in Florida for a couple of days. Warm sunshine. Life was good. Um, and then actually some exciting news for the press of Atlantic City. We reopened our office. We uh, were office list from January until uh, just about the beginning of December here. So we are back in an office. Um, it's nice to talk to more than one person at a time and, uh, enjoying it there too. That's wonderful. Glad you finally got that thing moving up there in Jersey. I know it has been a long, long time coming and, and of course, enjoying a little Florida warmth, but for our guests this week, we're going to the other side of the continent. Of course, we're in the midst now of meteorological winter, which started on the 1st of December. Astronomical winter starts on the 21st, so we're really starting to get into the thick of it. We haven't had any extended cold on the East Coast yet, as as Joe Martucci will tell you, but our our time is coming. We've looked at some of the extended range guidance, and about a week or so from now, we're finally going to get our, our shot of cold, but we want to talk about real cold. And with that, we want to bring in our guest this week, Brian Brettschneider. He's a climatologist working for the National Weather Service in Alaska. Now, Brian is famous in weather circles for his social media presence and the weather maps that he produces and shares from the serious to the silly. And I just love watching him tweet. He's at uh, Climatologist49, for those of you on Twitter. So I want to say thank you, Brian, for joining us on the Across the Sky podcast. Glad to be here and looking forward to uh, to talking uh, about winter and cold with you guys. So first things first, Alaska, man, um, you always been in Alaska. Did you kind of move to Alaska? What what's what's the relationship there between you and Alaska? So uh, I'm not from Alaska. Uh, I'm from Texas. Um, And I we we our family moved, moved up here in 2006. So we're uh, we're at 16 years uh, living uh, in the Anchorage area the entire time and uh, and just loving it. All right. So so you're in Anchorage because sometimes I wonder, like, is he in Fairbanks? Is he in Alaska? I mean, excuse me, is he in Anchorage? Um, So my first question to get this started, are there any two or three things right off the bat that people in the lower 48 here think they know about Alaska? that are just straight up wrong about winter in Alaska? Well, I mean, we have kind of running jokes here. You know, people still think, you know, that some of us like live in igloos. 
um, or that, um, you know, I, I remember being at the airport uh, here in Anchorage and someone was at the rental car counter and they asked, you know, are the roads paved? Um, and so I, I think people, people, I mean, we have lots of wilderness, lots of wide open spaces. And I, I think people uh, consider it um, uh, mostly undeveloped. Um, and and they're, they're kind of surprised to learn that we have, you know, Costco and Walmart and, you know, Bed Bath and & Beyond and so on. So it's, you know, it's it's different living up here. Um, and it's, it's kind of exotic in, in a lot of ways. Um, but it's not um, it's not so different that people, um, you know, wouldn't wouldn't recognize the sights and the sounds other than um the uh the climate around them all right before i toss it other to the other guys real quick we are getting into into winter time now in alaska mm -hmm. and remind people about the uh the daylight issue there this time of year in alaska you know so that the daylight is something that people that, that you notice immediately and that's not just in winter uh in summer as well and you know, as someone who, who grew up in in the in the lower 48, you know, I remember thinking, you know, getting off work at five and like, oh, man, it's the sun's, you know, just barely above the horizon or it's almost sunset. You know, but if you're in somewhere like Dallas or, you know, or Phoenix, you know, the difference between the shortest day of the year and the longest day of the year um, is about, you know, maybe four hours of daylight, maybe 10 hours in the winter and 14 in the summer. And it gets progressively more. Uh, the farther north you go, so that by the time you get to like Seattle, you know maybe it's uh, that that difference from from summer to winter is more like you know eight hours, um, you know. But up up in Alaska, it's even more magnified. So uh, so right now uh, today, I think sunrise. I mean, it's nine fifteen right now, and it's it's well, it's starting to get twilight, a uh, little 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 light outside. The sunrise won't be till about ten o'clock, and sunset is I think around 3, 3.40. Um, so literally when you start the work day, it's dark. And when you end the work day, it's dark. Um, and, and so in between, so, and that, that gets to people, you know, even up here, that, that, that gets to people. Of course, the flip side of that is in the summertime, um, it's either daylight or twilight, all, you know, 24 hours a day, you know, so the, the two don't exactly balance out. And actually the equation is we end up with more daylight uh, over the course of the year than, than anywhere in the lower 48. But, um, but it, it's very noticeable because it changes um, for much of the year by here in Anchorage by five, six minutes a day, right? So in a week, your daylight has changed by 45 minutes. And if you're in Fairbanks, it's changing by seven, eight minutes a day. Um, and then up on the North Slope, it's changing by like 11, 12 minutes a day for much of the year. So, so literally... You know, from one from one Saturday to the next Saturday, it can be it's noticeably different. It's not just it kind of it feels maybe a little different. It's noticeably different. Hey, Brian, it's Matt. And just thinking about how short a day could be in the winter is pretty, pretty mind boggling. But you caught my ear when you said you're from Texas. I'm from Texas originally as well. So can you walk me through that transition when you made the move to Alaska? What would you say was the biggest shock to your system? And for anybody else who's thinking about making the move to Alaska, what should they be prepared for if they're moving up uh, from the lower 48? Well, I mean, aside from obviously the, uh, the climate differences, well, so like in Anchorage or in Fairbanks, um, no houses have air conditioning. I mean, like zero. Um, now, office buildings and stores, they have air conditioning, um, but uh, houses, none, zero. And, you know, the low sun angle is actually something so even in, in the middle of summer, the sun is about 50 degrees above the horizon. So it's almost coming, you know, almost at a 45 degree angle to you. And so, you know, if you're in, again, if you're in Dallas, you, if you put a, a hat on in the middle of the day, you're blocking most of the direct rays. They're not hitting, you know, your the side of your face or your nose, but here they are. And so you you feel like you're constantly being, you know, attacked by the sun, even though the temperatures are lower. And because houses are built to retain every molecule of heat with that low sun angle coming in windows, you know, you're, it, the sun just penetrates every corner of your house and it really warms up, you know, especially if you have southerly facing windows, 
it's not uncommon if, if you haven't like cracked your windows to come home and it's 90 degrees in your house, you know, on a day where it's 75 degrees out. And so, uh, so that, that kind of is a little bit of a, a shock to the system, you know, and, and cities are built up for their climate. And so we have, you know, a, lo a lot of the, the way that uh, you, you just see the roads designed and buildings designed are, you know, you, you're like, well, why is there this big open area right here? And like, and in the winter, you're like, oh, well, that's where they pile up all the snow. You know, they, they got to have some place for it. Or at the airport, you know, the, the parking garage, there's a big, like a big uh, hole in the side of the gap in the side of the, the railing on the top. And that's where they plows push the snow over the edge. <laughs> you know, so so you, 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 you design things with snow storage, snow removal, cold temperatures, you know, how, how just, you know, how deep pipes are built and the way that you do basements and, and stuff like that. So, but, you know, I, I like to tell people, you know, growing up in Texas and living in Texas for half my life, you know, you don't wake up in July and say, hmm, I wonder if it's going to be hot today. It is. You don't say, I wonder if I'm going to sweat today. Um, you will. And in Alaska in the winter, you don't wonder, you don't, you don't get up and say, I wonder, I wonder if there's going to be snow on the ground today, or I wonder if it's going to be cold today. It is. And there will be snow. And, you know, I think like in the month of January, in 50 years, Anchorage has had like 11 days where there was no snow on the ground. Um, so it's just it's just always there. It's ever present. And um, and you get used to that. And and you and you come to, you know, if so here we just had a big snowstorm. And today is the second day in a row. School's canceled, which is very uncommon. Most of the time that school is canceled in the winter, it's the exact opposite. It's when we have record warmth, not snow, not cold. Record warmth is what cancels school because all the side streets are snow covered the entire winter. And if you have record warmth, it melts the top layer of snow, but it's cold underneath it. So it freezes into a layer of ice and then no one can move around. So it's the record warm days. It's days where it's 45 degrees, 40, 45 degrees in winter. That's when school's canceled. Hey, Brian, Joe, a uh, small funny question for you. Do people have pools in Alaska? Do it, they have uh, pools? Yeah. Uh, no. So there, there's no um, in-ground swimming pools. Zero. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, because the, the frost line, um, you know, will penetrate, you know, depending on how much snow cover there is, you know, three feet. Well, that's just going to. That with the 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 expansion of the the ice, that's just going to um, obliterate any um, uh, concrete that you're you know you're pouring for a a pool. I've seen like two above ground pools, you know the kind that you can buy. I don't know how much they cost, but my, now what you do my see, neighbor, my you, parents' house have one of those, the big blow up inflatable ones, like yeah. the huge ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So that you know, like if, when I'm flying into Vegas or Phoenix, and I see a quarter or a third of the houses with uh, swimming pools, I just think that's just you, you can't do that in Alaska. I mean, and plus, how do you? You're going to have to warm up the water. You know, you're talking about a lot of energy because in the summer, like here in Anchorage, our, our normal high is 66 and our normal low is 52. Um, so that's 59 degrees is your average daily temperature. Well, how many people want to swim in 59 degree water? Um, you know, that's, Not that's like, yeah. Um, so you, then you're going to have to pay electricity or, or utilities to heat it up by 15 degrees. And, and, and that's at peak summer, uh, more the rest of the year. And, you know, it, it's not practical to keep it warm in, in the winter. And your your swimming season would only be, you know, three or four months uh, at the most. So it's just it's just not practical at all. And, and similarly, you know, one of the things living in other places, uh, golf is a, is a popular recreational activity for several reasons. But it's and we have I think Alaska has like four golf courses, maybe five in the whole state. And it's just in part is because this, the season is so short. And I think all but one of the golf courses, maybe all but two are on military bases because you get people coming up from the military and they're used to playing golf from somewhere else. And, and I think the other part is golf in, in many, especially in urban areas, suburban areas is kind of a, it's kind of a nature setting uh, kind of, you know, surrounded by development and businesses and stuff. But 
but we're already surrounded by na nature setting. So there's kind of no, there's no need to kind of find that kind of artificial uh, na natural setting when it, when it's already there to begin with. So, so that is something um, that, that is a little different. We have a couple of, of indoor, we have like one or two indoor, like, golf courses like driving ranges where it's like a video thing and you hit it and it shows where your ball lands or stuff like that yeah um but yeah no swimming pools uh swimming's not a big deal here <laughs> yeah you know i so i have to say one of my uh favorite pastimes is going on google earth and finding how far north you see pools in people's google earth mm -hmm. imagery uh mm -hmm. and i have seen like one or two in anchorage but they probably are those above ground big inflatable ones that google caught so I'm going to keep an yeah. eye out for that next time I ha I'm uh, bored alone on a uh, Wednesday night. I'm going to see what I can find on Google. <laughs> but yeah, um, let me know if you find an uh, uh, in-ground one because I, <laughs> I've, I've never seen one. And, and, and again, the um, the logistics of it would be it would be destroyed by yeah. uh, by the freezing, the freeze thaw cycle. Kind of going on that same point. I, I think I have seen some some farms in Alaska, some small farms. There are. So just north of Anchorage um, in the Matanuska and Susitna Valleys, there is some agricultural land where they, um, well, they grow a lot of vegetables uh, or, or some vegetables and also some uh, like some hay and stuff for livestock. There used to be dairy operations. And so you needed you needed to feed for the, the dairy cattle. And then there's there's some grains that are grown south of uh, Fairbanks in the Delta Junction area. You know, there was a in part of uh, Roosevelt's, uh, you know, New Deal initiatives. One of them was to encourage settlement of Alaska um, by, you know, offering, you know, homesteads to uh, to people that would come up and and do agricultural, you know, would homestead agricultural tracts, and you know, that they'd have they'd get the land for free, I believe. So, so there is there's a there is kind of a you know a, a ninety year history of. Uh, some agricultural activity up here, but it's it's small, very small, and and pretty niche. One of the things about the agriculture, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I have this, I have these, you know, visions from when I was a kid watching television and vegetables and things like that. And so, let me know if this is true that you could grow bigger vegetables in Alaska because you do have more daylight during the summer. This is why we have these gargantuan like mm -hmm. pumpkins and, and things. Is that true or is that just stuck in my head and it's wrong? That is absolutely true. Uh, there are some vegetables where like the world record biggest were actually grown in Alaska. 2,000 pound pumpkin and you know 50 pound broccoli or, or whatever. Because yeah, so it's a short growing season, but once it starts, it's basically growing 24 hours a day. There's no diurnal cycle. I mean, it picks up during the daytime, but it's still growing at night. There's still solar energy at two in the morning. Um, and so it, it's, it really is, you know, it's, it's agriculture on steroids. So what is the growing season there in, in Anchorage? You know, so in Anchorage, our first freezes are typically mid to late September. And our last freeze is usually the first couple of days of May. Um, now for vegetables, they're a little more frost tolerant. Uh, you know, uh, it's not like oranges or grapefruit or something. As far as in, in the agriculturally productive areas north of Anchorage, I don't know. It's, it's a little, it's probably a, a little shorter season um, by maybe two weeks or so. Got it. Uh, all right. So that's good to know. So we've got kind of like this, this idea of uh, some of the, the neat things that happen or unusual things that happen in, um, in the shoulder months in the summer. When we come back after we take a break, we want to talk to Brian a little bit more deeply about some of the winter weather uh, adventures, if you will, he has there in Alaska. So stay with us. We'll be right back on the Across the Sky podcast. And welcome back, everybody, to the Across the Sky podcast. I'm Sean Sublett, meteorologist from the Richmond Times-Dispatch, talking with Brian Bretschneider, climatologist in Alaska. We talked a little bit before the break about some of the uniquenesses of, uh, of Alaska, not necessarily in the winter, but really so much in the summer and some of the things that you have to kind of acclimate to. But let's go back to the winter for a second. Brian, I have to imagine there's a lot of wintertime recreational activities that that you can do there that you wouldn't do in the in the lower 48 but at some point 
it's probably also too cold or dangerous to do there. So can you just just riff on a couple of that those kinds of things for us? Well, uh, so to take the last part first, you know, one of the things that um, I, I sometimes hear people say, and I think they they're well intentioned, but it's it's not really accurate. People will say, "Oh, well, once you get below zero, it all feels the same," and that is absolutely not the case. You know, thirty and forty below is painful. It hurts. Zero degrees, you bundle up and you're fine. Um, there's a huge difference between what I would consider cold, you know, sub-zero, and really cold, you know, maybe 25 to 30 below zero and colder. It, it's noticeable. Everything about it is very noticeable and very different. You know, when I talk to my friends like up in Fairbanks, they talk about what the skiing is like. So skiing, cross-country skiing, and not downhill skiing. Downhill skiing is is so downhill skiing is a little bit popular. We have one kind of main resort, one kind of four-star resort in the state, and that's the Alieska Resort in Girdwood near Anchorage, um, which is interesting because most ski resorts, you know, they start, they're way up in the mountains, you know, the, the top of the chairlift might be, in the Rockies might be at 10, 11,000 feet, and you got, you know, 2,000, 2,500 foot vertical. You know, this ski resort, the top of the chairlift is like at 2,500 feet, and you ski down to 500 feet. Um, and, um, and it, it's, you know, steep, it, it's just like it, just like, uh, anything in, you know, Vail or Jackson hole, except you're eight or 9,000 feet lower. So, but, um, so, but what most people do who, who downhill ski is they put skins on their skis and they, um, they skin up, you know, some backcountry slope and they get up to a couple thousand feet and then they take the skins off and they ski down. Very, very popular, much more popular than ski resort skiing. And but it all, there's also a lot of um, cross country skiing, cross country skiing and fat tire biking. If you've heard of that, it's very, very popular. You know, here in Anchorage, we have trails that fully connect the entire city uh, in multiple directions. So you can you can ski or bike all across town uh, without having to, you know, cross a major highway or anything like that. You, you can you can get it around. Uh, independently of a, of a vehicle. But when it gets below maybe about minus 10, uh, the cross-country skiing is a lot harder. You know, the the, uh, the, the frost and the uh, and the granules of snow make uh, make it kind of like skiing uh, through through sand. So that's um, uh, that, that's definitely different. Um, and as far as other kind of recreating, you know, when if you look at maps of say Wyoming and Colorado and you know, some of the places out west, you'll uh, highway maps, you'll see a lot of the roads through the mountains, they'll say closed in winter. And here it's really the opposite, a lot, especially in, in off what we call the road network off outside of, you know, the, the main highway system, you'll see designations for, you know, winter route or closed in summer. Uh, because we really wait for things to freeze up uh, for traveling, you know, you can travel across ice, you can't travel across mud. And so many areas are mud, you know, through the summer or swamp, but then they freeze up and you zip right through them. And in fact, the rivers are the highways between communities in rural Alaska. You know, they wait for that freeze up so they can get on a snow machine or in many cases, uh, a truck or a car and drive 200 miles down the middle of the river, you know, to get to other communities. Um, you know, we had a congressional delegation seven or eight years ago. I think we had like six U.S. senators that were driving in a vehicle down the Kuskokwim River. And so, so there, there are things you, you really wait for freeze up to do. And as far as recreation here in town, you know, there's lake, you know, ice skating. Um, there's, you know, you can, you can bike what we call fat tire bike uh, down to the Connect Glacier um, or across um, Portage Lake to get to Portage Glacier or, you know, Spencer Lake to get Spencer Glacier. You know, there's, there's a lot of, things that you can access once it freezes up. And so uh, so that's kind of neat that there are places you can get to only in the winter. And then in the summer, you know, there are places where you you can't access, but in other cases, you know, if you if you want to go, you know, traversing through the mountains, you really can't do that in the winter because avalanche concerns are just so great. But once the snow melts, you can you can do all kinds of uh, adventures in the mountains, which are uh, which are really neat. You know, one of the things that we talked about the low sun angle earlier is, you know, and, and I actually lived in the Chicago area for a couple of years 
when I was uh, in my in my teenage years. And you know, and it would snow. We had a couple of big snows every year. It seemed like. But even in, in January in Chicago, the sun angle kind of is like this, you know, it'll melt the driveways and the sidewalks and the roads. And then, yeah, the snow will stay on the grass. Um, but the sun energy, the direct solar energy is a big part of the, um, uh, the energy budget. So you could actually have your, your, your snow, let's say there's three inches of snow on, 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 a, on a driveway. Even if the temperature is 30 degrees, you know, it'll shrink throughout the day because the sun is getting it, uh, is working it, working on it. Here, that doesn't happen in the winter because I'm right, like today, the max solar angle, I think is going to be seven degrees above the horizon. And um, it's just not enough, even if it's sunny and you can kind of feel the sun, it's just not enough to work on the snow. So even if it's like 35, even 40 degrees, you, you get no snow melt at all, none. You know, so snow actually, you know, accumulates. I mean, there's compression, but the snow depth accumulates through the winter and it peaks here in Anchorage on March 1st. So like, for example, Buffalo had, the airport itself had three feet of snow in that lake effect snow event a few weeks ago. Other areas had more, but the airport snow depth went up to 23 or four inches. And I think 11 days later, it was gone. No snow depth. And that was in part the temperature, but in part the sun angle, the, the early November mid, or mid-November sun angle. We had almost for three weeks, we had no snow here or we had one inch of snow. And in those three weeks, our snow depth went from four inches to five inches. It didn't go down at all, uh, even though we had some days that were at or above freezing. Um, and so that, that that you asked earlier, that's something I think people in the lower 48 don't realize in the winter conditions. Yeah, the, the sun, shorter days, everyone notices the shorter days. The sun's energy is basically non-existent. Even when it's above the horizon, no solar energy at all um, to work on. So like, you know, like when I go and measure, I measure ice at a, at a, at a neighborhood lake, um, you know, the, the ice thickness never decreases. It only increases. You never like, oh, it's a sunny day, so I'm going to get like melts on the top of it. Doesn't happen ever, um, because that that sun's energy just isn't strong enough to to melt that top layer. So, and of course, the benefit of that is you don't. That would create icy conditions uh, if you're going to melt the snow on top of the road. Um, of course, if if that sun was providing energy, it would melt the snow eventually on the road. And, and that's why we don't see our side streets. You know, my the side street outside my neighborhood. Um, I won't see any pavement, any blacktop until at least the third week of March. Um, and if there's snow throughout March until the first of April, it just, it just won't happen. Um, so, so that lack of solar energy is, is something that, uh, that you don't really think about until once you're up here. So the conclusion I'm drawing here, if you're a snow lover, Alaska is yeah. the place to be. <laughs> because it seems yeah. like there is snow so much of the time there. And so the question I have, because the thing that everybody wants, no matter, even for the, the folks that don't really like snow, one thing that seems like everybody agrees, everybody wants a white Christmas. So has there ever not been a white Christmas since you've been in Alaska or throughout history? How many times has there not been a white Christmas, like in Anchorage, for example? Well, for Anchorage, uh, the last time there was not a white Christmas was 1985. And so, the, but, and there's, there's a 95% uh, chance of it uh, Fairbanks uh, had one non-white Christmas in 1934. Juneau is about a 50-50 chance. You know, and I mentioned earlier that, you know, you wake up in the winter and there's just, there's there's going to be snow on the ground. And that's, you know, so so you're, you're in Chicago, uh, Matt. If I said, um, if you just look at the core winter months, DJF, what would you say the median snow depth is for all December, January, February days in Chicago? The median snow depth. Oh, geez. You know, because of that sun angle, you're absolutely right. It really isn't that much because, uh, you know, and also that you have to talk about, you know, which part of Chicago, too, because you usually there's more in the suburbs versus uh, downtown Chicago. So, yeah, the snow depth oftentimes is only about two, three, four inches. I mean, except right after a big snow, but it usually doesn't last. It often melts away pretty quickly. No, but if, if you look at, say, 30 years worth of December, January and February days, what would you say the, the median snow depth is for all those days? In, in at Chicago O'Hare. Oh gosh, probably only about four inches. I'm how gonna about go with zero. I'm gonna go with how about oh, zero, on, Brian. 
I'm going to go zero. 1.9. It's zero. Wow. So I, 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 I did a little bit of a sleight of hand. Um, I said the median snow depth. So it turns out in December, January, February, snow is on the ground at Chicago O'Hare on about 45% of the days. So that means 55% of the days, there's none. So the median is actually zero. Um, uh, that's the median winter snow depth in, in Chicago. And so and I use that as an example because, um, you know, it's, again, it's always on the ground here all winter long. Um, you know, it, it, the I think the average is we have winter or snow on the ground for like 140 consecutive days. That's a typical winter every day for 140 days or in a row, plus a few days before winter snowpack and a few days after the, the last snowpack has probably melted out. So uh, that consistency of, of every day. So even though we average here in Anchorage 75 inches of snow a year, so twice what Chicago averages, less than what Buffalo averages, because there's no melt or very little melt. If we have a big, what we call Chinook wind event, uh, we can melt snow, very windy and, um, and and some warm temperatures. But, but basically, we don't melt snow. It just, it just the snow depth just increases through the winter. Well, what is the median snow depth, let's say, in January there? So it's going to, in January, probably actually only about nine or 10 inches. So we end up with compaction. Now, one of the things I, I, I joke with people about is, um, you know, if we get kind of a wet snow, I'll complain about, you know, being kind of, what, and I'm, I'm joking, but uh, crappy lower 48 snow, you know, like 10 to one ratio snow. Uh, to us, 10 to one ratio snow is like, uh, you know, uh, cement, you know, it's like, you know, it's kind of it's junk snow. You know, our snow that we had, our 20 inches of snow we had here the other day was probably about a 18, to one ratio, um, and I've seen I've seen uh, forty to one ratio snow. Um, you know that accumulates six inches here in town. So, so it, it's the it's the consistency that it's just always there. And to put that in context for anybody who might not be, you know, some of our people that might be listening in the south and aren't familiar with snow ratios, the higher that ratio, when you're talking about forty to one, we're talking about a really dry snow. So the takeaway here is there's not a lot of wet snows. In Alaska, so I guess there's not a lot of snowmen being made in snowballs. I imagine that would be pretty difficult in Alaska since the snow is so dry. You can't make a snowman uh, unless it's right at the beginning of the season. You know, you get a wet snow at the beginning of the season or a wet snow at the end of the season. Um, but I, I, again, we just got 20 inches of snow. There's no way I could go out and make a um, a snowman. Now, the nice thing about dry snow is that it's it's easier to shovel per per inch of snow. You know, in many cases, um, I'll go and just use a broom to uh, to shovel, you know, the front steps and stuff. I won't use a, uh, uh, a shovel. And and you see people like at uh, car dealerships, they'll go around, they'll just have a leaf blower, leaf blower to blow the snow off the cars, you know, it's because it's, it's pretty dry snow. So that's, um, but yeah, so usually uh, the, the snow ratios are, are much fluffier. And that's because the temperatures are lower, right? The, um, you know, your, your biggest snowflakes in the dendritic growth zone are at like, in the, in the clouds are at about 10 degrees, five, five or 10 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So um, that kind of thermal profile is, is more common here. In, in almost everywhere in the lower 48, unless you're like north of Minneapolis. So when does it snow? It snows when the temperature is below normal, right? So wherever you guys are, on any day where you're accumulating snow, I almost can guarantee the average daily temperature will end up being below normal that day. Here, it's usually the opposite. A snow day is warmer than normal, you know, just because of that, that, that increased moisture in the air. And, but that said, the, the thermal profile here is, is almost always, you know, more conducive to those bigger dendrites on the flakes. So it's, um, it just tends to pile up a little bit more here. Um, but we also, because of the colder, overall colder air mass, we don't get those well, today, yesterday, notwithstanding, we don't get those, you know, two and three foot snow events that they that you can get in Boston and, and New York occasionally. We just we just don't get it. We average here in Anchorage, we average two or three six inch snows a year, um, and we just get lots of little snows, lots of two inch snows, a couple of three inch snows, a bunch of one inch snows. You know, the snow that we had two days ago was our biggest December snow in over twenty years. It's just you know twenty inches of snow. 
in 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 24 hours was an enormous deal, a big, big deal for us. Hey, Brian, it's Joe again. D- talk to us a little bit about the different kinds of winter in terms of where you are in Alaska, because winter in Anchorage is, I'm assuming, different than winter in Fairbanks, winter in Nome, mm-hmm. winter in Juneau. So talk to us about like the geographies of maybe a couple different places that people would know in Alaska and what winter is like, because I, just looking over the average temperatures for Anchorage, I think if you lived in Minneapolis or you lived in Fargo, North Dakota, probably wouldn't be too much different. But I definitely think it would be different if you were in somewhere like Fairbanks, let's say. That's a great question. And so let me work from south to north. So winter in Juneau, I wouldn't want to be in winter in Juneau. So Juneau averages about 90 or so inches of snow a year, and they can get some really big dumps of snow. But they also get a lot of winter rain. And so it's just a slop fest in, in Juneau. And with all the rain and the slush and the and the sloppiness, and then it drops below freezing. Every time I've gone to Juneau in the winter, it's just been like an ice rink. It's I don't know how people can deal with that. It's constant snow, rain, refreezing, ice. And they have the low sun angle too, especially if you're in a shaded area. So, you know, parking lots are going to be icy for months. And so I've, I've talked a lot about Anchorage, but if you move north to Fairbanks, um, it's the cold. It is the cold. I mean, in, in January, an average high of like, you know, one or two, I think is a normal high and a, a normal low is like minus 18, 19. You know, record highs most day are just above freezing and is serious cold. So, um, you know, minus 40 degrees, uh, that's that's serious cold. I mean, stuff stuff breaks, you know, you have to your car won't start or you, and your tires are square because the uh, the air pressure and it freezes into a square um, and you have to have oil pan heaters and there are electrical outlets at you know, restaurants and stores. Uh, so you can plug your car in when you go inside. You know, you go to the grocery store and half the cars, they're running. Because uh, people just leave their, their engine running while they're in the store, while they're tanking up on their gas. Um, just to, just so to make sure it starts up when they're ready to go, when they're ready to leave. So in Fairbanks, it's really about the cold, cold. And then once you get in Western and Northern Alaska, it's about the wind. You know, I know, you know, it can get windy in the plains and stuff, but, but when you're in the tundra and there's no trees, the wind is relentless. It's always there and it's blowing the snow around and it's making itself, obviously it's dropping the wind chills. And, you know, if, if you're out on a trail, like if you're on a snow machine, we call them snow machines, 30 minutes later, you might not know where your trail going back is because just the wind has filled in the snow from where you left your tracks. Obviously, if you're if you're in the river valley, you know, you know, you're in the river valley, but, you know, there can be open leads in the water and stuff. And, and you try to try to go back the way you came, you know, so you don't fall through and into the water. Um, and a lot of the rivers, they'll, people will put in uh, uh, markers and stuff of, of where you should travel and, and so on. But but it's the wind. And again, it's the consistent uh, snow, snow cover, just months on end. You know, Fairbanks will be completely snow covered from mid-October through late April, almost every year, every single day. So the consistency of the snow cover, the low sun angle, the short days, um, you know, th- those those aspects don't change, but but it's the, the difference in temperatures and the difference in wind. Um, there's really no comparison to, there's no analog in the lower 48 for what winter you know, in Juneau would be like, except maybe maybe a little bit like Buffalo or Syracuse, where you can get warm up and cool down and ice refreezing and stuff. Uh, but certainly no analogs for winter in Western Alaska. All right, real quick before we let you go, because we know you're on a schedule, Brian. Um, climate change in Alaska. We know that Alaska is warming way faster than than the lower 48. The mm-hmm. Arctic is warming a lot faster than the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. And the little time we have left where we got to cut you loose, what, what are some of the things you've seen? What are the things that, that, that concern you the most? Well, as I like to tell people, you know, my kids are teenagers and they talk about what it, what it used to be like here. Uh, and so the changes are rapid. Um, and yeah, we, we, it's still Alaska. It's still cold. We still get snow. Um, but, but the winter season is shrinking. Um, and so we're getting, we're actually getting a little more snow in December, January, but a lot less snow in October and a lot less snow in April. 
Um, so for now, our, our season total is hanging in there. But what happens in those marginal seasons is really important because the difference in the solar budget between um, uh, snow and no snow is huge. In April, a very high sun angle, right? And so if there's no snow in the ground, the, the ground is absorbing solar energy for 18 hours. Whereas if there's snow, it's bouncing off that snow. It's like it never happened. So it's a, it's a huge difference. And you notice it. You notice it when you're driving on the highway and you can see, oh, there used to be glaciers there. Oh, there's not anymore. Uh, oh, look at the tree line on the mountains. Uh, it used to be tundra there. And now it's, it's, it's all brushy and alders and, and stuff. Oh, we used to be able to, you know, walk out to Portage Glacier, you know, for, for three months during the winter. And now, you know, maybe in a big cold snap, there'll be two weeks where you can go out there and the glacier is a half mile receded. Everyone notices it. Um, there, there's no one, even your hardest, hardcore, you know, uh, let's burn more coal, you know, person, they notice the changes there, and there's never been any, any uh, dispute about that. Um, but it, it is, you know, it's, it's accelerating, it's really affecting people's lives and not just in a kind of a novelty way of, you know, glaciers receding and stuff, you know, it, it, it affects the way of life for people that live in 80% of the state who rely on frozen rivers for transportation, who rely, who don't have a, a grocery store, they don't have a Walmart, you know, they need the fish and the game for subsistence um, and, and for travel and, thing, and, you know, for getting supplies in and stuff. So there's a, there's a tangible effect on people's lives here. And what happens in Alaska doesn't stay in Alaska. So the sea level rise that you're experiencing in Atlantic City or in Miami, um, is directly related to what's happening right here. It's our glaciers melting and adding water to the oceans. It's our previously snow-covered lands in spring and fall that are now absorbing solar energy that's warming up the entire earth. It's our sea ice that's much less uh, extensive than it used to be. That's you know adding to the energy budget and changing ocean circulations. So what happens here doesn't just affect me and the people that live near me. It affects you guys and everyone who's listening. Yeah, Brian, I think that's a point that we always need to kind of drive home that the the planet is connected. What happens in one part of the world affects what happens in another part of the world. And one of the things we so often say here in the lower 48, we try to tell people what happens in Alaska and the Arctic doesn't stay there. Brian, we know you're on the clock, so we're going to let you go. We appreciate you joining us on the podcast. Uh, aside from Climatologist 49, any other places people can find you on the uh, on the interwebs, as it were? Um, I mean, I do have a blog that I, um, I, I think it's called uh, usclimateblogspot.com. I mean, just Google my name and blog or something. And I, I put some stuff in there from time to time, um, not regularly, so it's not a good place to uh, to, to keep up. Uh, the main part, of, main area is, is Twitter at Climatologist49. That's where I post most frequently. And yeah, that, that's certainly the best way. All right, great. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Brian Brett Schneider, climatologist working for the National Weather Service in Anchorage, Alaska. We're going to cut him loose. And the three of us guys will be right back for some parting thoughts on the Across the Sky podcast. Looking beyond the atmosphere, here's Tony Rice with your Astronomy Outlook. Early Thursday morning, NASA plans the launch of the Surface Water and Ocean Topography Mission, or SWAT. It's a joint program between NASA and the French Space Agency, along with additional instruments provided by the British and Canadian space agencies, to measure the height of water in Earth's lakes, rivers, reservoirs, and the ocean. SWAT will help us better understand where the water is today, where it's coming from, and where it might be tomorrow. It's also going to provide a better picture of how the ocean helps mitigate climate change by absorbing heat and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This will help better understand ocean warming, sea level rise, and how bodies of water respond to changing precipitation patterns, critical to improving drought as well as flood forecasting. SWAT works with a pair of antennae. They stretch out about as wide as a tennis court, beaming a signal which bounces off the Earth's surface. It's received and analyzed using interferometry to provide a 3D view. This is much higher resolution than previous missions and will provide data on the world's lakes larger than 15 acres and rivers wider than 333 feet. 
NASA TV launch coverage starts at 3 a.m. Pacific, 6 a.m. Eastern, ahead of a scheduled 3.46 a.m. Pacific launch from the Vandenberg Space Force Base along the central California coast. Launches headed for a nearly polar orbit like this one are visible throughout central and especially southern California and may be visible as far east as Nevada and Arizona. You can learn more about the mission at swat.jpl.nasa.gov. Elsewhere in the sky, all five visible planets are above the horizon and visible after dark throughout the end of December. This week, though, is the best time to spot elusive Mercury, which is usually lost in the sun's glare. Towards the end of this week, it's at its greatest elongation east, or separation from the sun. Look southeast after sunset for Venus near the horizon, followed by tiny Mercury, and then spread out a bit more, Saturn, Jupiter, and finally Mars in the east. The crescent moon joins the show on Christmas night. That's your astronomy outlook. Follow me at RTP Hokey for more spacey stuff like this. And thanks, Tony. That's Tony Rice, RTP Hokey on Twitter. Always great to get astronomy stuff from my buddy there uh, in the Raleigh-Durham Triangle of North Carolina. Uh, Matt and Joe, I just always love hearing from Brett there in Alaska, giving us a real perspective on on what life is like there, not just during the winter, but during the summer as well. Yeah, it was great. I mean, he's somebody uh, kind of on my white whale list just because of how prolific he is on Twitter and all the maps he put out. We even talk about a lot of the maps that he put out. Some of them, you know, that he does put are are tremendous. They're like, you, you think about something and then he goes to the next level and puts out a map on it. So we'll have to get him back to talk more about that. But uh, yeah, it was cool for him to talk about the different kinds of winters across Alaska at the end too. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad we got him on. So kudos to you, Sean, for getting him on. Yeah, thanks, man. You know, I didn't even think about that in, in Juneau for those not familiar with the geography that's on the southeastern um, panhandle right on the, the Pacific coastline. And if I'm correct, it used to be that you could not get to Juneau by car. You could only get there by plane and then you could drive once you were around there. But I have to imagine, you know, you're going to get these cold outbreaks. You get this Pacific heavy rain events. Then you can get the snow and things icing over. Uh, that sounds just horrible. What do you think, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his description of winters in Alaska. I mean, you know, if, if you're a snow lover, that is definitely the place to be. But man, that just when he was talking about, oh, you know, when it's zero degrees, it's no big deal. It's when it gets minus 20 or minus 30. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's just sounds uh -huh. horrible. I mean, I think most people are like zero. That's that's way that's really cold. And he's like, oh, no big deal. Uh, so that's just a whole nother beast. You have to really like cold weather i think to live in alaska i've never been to alaska uh but my plan is to go in the summertime i i don't have any plans uh to visit in the winter after that description i think that's just a little too cold for me that is next level kind of stuff i mean guys b before we wrap up I, I want each one of you to think about this for a moment i'll start but what's the coldest air temperature you have ever been outside it for me i was in grad school at penn state and i think it was january of 1994 we had just had some snow and i remember this very well we were kind of wandering around the weather station like it's probably going to get to minus four or minus five tonight we woke up in the morning it was 18 below zero and i remember it wasn't windy obviously if you're going to get the radiational cooling light winds the clear sky and the temperature just tanking but I remember being outside when it was minus 18. I only had to be outside for a block. I walked one block and I was like, you can keep this, man. Um, I it 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 as Brian said, you reach a point where the cold is legitimately painful. It's whole next level kind of stuff. Uh, and I've never been that cold. I just soon never be that cold again now matt you're in chicago you grew up in texas what's the coldest you've ever been in okay so the coldest temperature was when i was actually in colorado so my grandmother lives in silverborn colorado which is up in the mountains of colorado about an hour and a half west of denver and one winter it was around christmas time we were visiting her and it hit minus 12 and so i had to go outside and see what it felt like now to be clear, this was one of those nights where it was completely clear skies and it was absolutely calm outside. So I will say that I was surprised how warm it felt, but let me be clear, it was not warm. But because it was so calm, there was no wind at all. I was like, I actually was expecting this to be worse. 
but I did not stay out very long and I, w- I went right back inside. But I was a little bit surprised that it didn't feel colder and it was minus 12 and it was certainly cold enough. Joe, what you got, buddy? Uh, you guys both beat me here. I got uh, I got a negative four for you. How about that? Oh, that's all right. That was we'll, in. Uh, we'll that let was in you Hack- play. You'll let me play. That was in uh, Hackettstown, New Jersey, in the northwest corner of the state. At my last job, I used to work at a uh, Weatherworks, and uh, I was working the overnight shift. Uh, weather's a lot of shift work. We'll have to talk about that one day. But uh, it was, you know, maybe three or four in the morning, and it got down to negative four. And I said, "Let me go outside." And we did the, uh, you know, where you take the uh, water and you throw it out into the sky and you make the uh, the cloud. Uh, we did one of those. But uh, yeah, I only got negative four. I'm not as cool as you guys. No pun intended. That's all right. Uh, I think you're excused. But yeah, once it that is funny, though, Matt, what you mentioned before, when the wind isn't blowing, it, it does help so much, you know, and to like to the, to the point that that he was bringing up earlier, when it's when the sun is out, at least in our latitude, maybe not at Alaska, but if it's 10 or 15 degrees above zero and the sun is out and the wind isn't blowing, it's tolerable easily tolerable if you dress for it um but yeah man once you start getting in these minus teens and minus 20s i i, I think i'm i'm kind of done with all that uh okay guys we're uh, running out of time so we're gonna go ahead and close up for this week next week we have my old buddy greg carbon joining us he's going to give us his top weather memories nationwide for the year 2022 greg carbon is a meteorologist working at the weather prediction center in washington dc he works for NOAA, national oceanic and atmospheric administration and he's been doing these like top 10 weather memories uh for years now so he's going to agree to join us to talk about uh, talk a bit about his weather memories for 2022 so for matt hollander in chicago joe martucci in atlantic city and we hope our our friend kirsten lang in tulsa feels better soon I'm meteorologist Sean Sublett. Thank you for joining us on the Across the Sky podcast, and we'll see you next week. Groovy.